A legend named Unitas once was idolized in this stadium. But the 70s have ushered in a new era in Baltimore Colt football. And now a baby-faced 25-year-old named Burt Jones commands the same sort of respect once reserved for names like Unitas, Moore, Amici, and Marchetti. Thousand-yard rusher Lydell Mitchell belongs to this new era, as do all the other confident young Colts, who have gelled under the careful tutelage of second-year coach Ted Marchabroda. Today, Marchabroda's opponent is rookie head coach Bill Tiger Johnson, who Cincinnati Bengals likewise own a great quarterback and soft-spoken Kenny Anderson, soon to become the NFL's all-time leading percentage passer. Every good secondary surgeon has an assistant, and in world-class sprinter Isaac Curtis, Anderson and the Bengals possess the game's premier wide receiver. Behind Anderson and Curtis, the Bengal roster is somewhat anonymous. But only three teams won more games than Cincinnati in 1975, a fact that Burt Jones and his young and coming Baltimore Colts know quite well. Burt Jones against Kenny Anderson, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Baltimore Colts, a classic AFC matchup in the NFL Game of the Week. The Bengals-Colts game would pit strength against strength. The passing of Ken Anderson, who now needs 20 more pass attempts to reach 1,500 to qualify as a leading passer in the NFL's new quarterback efficiency ratings, against Baltimore's sack pack that led the league last year with 59 quarterback insults. On the Bengals' first offensive play, Anderson gave the Colts' front four something to think about when he ran for 17 yards before ducking out of bounds. Though a quarterback who runs leaves himself vulnerable to the worst kind of contact, it also adds caution to an all-out pass rush. This would enable Cincinnati to test the Colts' secondary, which is made much better because of the front four's ability to apply pressure. It doesn't hurt when you have an Isaac Curtis to throw to, either. Curtis' hands are often overlooked. Isaac being more renowned for his speed, and this season the Bengals begat another burner in Billy Brooks from Oklahoma. Brooks' reception carried to the Colt 25. The Bengals, with time to throw, were gnawing away at Baltimore's suspect secondary until Lloyd Mumford stepped in front of an Anderson pass. Both Ken Anderson and Burt Jones throw often to their backs. This is not because they have weak arms, quite the contrary, both can get it downfield. Jones on the cold second series of the game did just that, teaming with Roger Carr, who with Big Burt gives Baltimore one of the most feared long range combinations in the league. A flick of Jones' wrist and the ball was there. This one covered 68 yards as Jones to Carr continued where they left off last season. In 1975, these two hooked up on 89 and 90 yarders on successive Sundays. Looking at the play from up top, we can see that Jones' pass was perfect. Carr was behind Ken Riley and never broke stride. Colts led 7 to nothing, and after stopping the Bengals, Jones came right back with another touchdown on his very next pass. Unfortunately for Jones, this one was the Bengal safety Tommy Casanova, who completed a 31-yard interception return to tie the game at 7. Looking at the play from the end zone reveals that Jones was trying to hit tight end Ray Chester, but committed the Cardinals' sin on the out pattern as he underthrew, enabling Casanova to step in front and pick off his pass.
Casanova, who in the offseason is studying to be a doctor, had done some real surgery on Burt Jones, while at the same time pumping life into the Bengals. With the score now 7-7, Cincinnati took complete control of the game. On Anderson's first pass of the second quarter, he showed that he too has long ball in his arm as he teamed with Chip Myers, who had gotten behind number 31, Nelson Muncy, for a 63-yard completion. Myers carried to the Colt 17, where on the very next play, Anderson spotted Bob Trumpy, who, like Myers, had gotten behind Muncy. The Bengals bounced into their first lead in the game, 14 to 7. The game had shifted into Bengal control. They had scored 14 straight points, and on the kickoff following Trumpy's touchdown, tiny Howard Stevens was put down hard by Tony Davis. In spite of his 5'5 stature, or maybe because of it, Stevens walked away from the accident, but the fired-up Bengals stifled Baltimore's offensive series. The Bengals, who had proved they could control the sack pack, Anderson had not yet been dumped, now reaped the benefits of a consistent passing game. With the Colts wary of Anderson's arm, the Bengals were able to move on Stan Fritz and number 45 double Heisman winner Archie Griffin's leg. Griffin went nine yards, Fritz 12 on the Bengal version of the draw. Fritz got 10 more as Bengals center Bob Johnson controlled Colt middle linebacker number 59 Jim Chayunsky. The key block on Fritz run up the gut. Bengal running got the ball close enough for a field goal that increased the Cincinnati lead to 17-7. On the Colts' next series, control of the game still rested with the Bengals as Jones' pass was deflected by a Colt receiver and intercepted by Ken Riley, who had earlier been burned by Roger Carr. But like the ball itself, on this play, control of the game slipped from Cincinnati to Baltimore. Burt Jones wound up with the ball again and a slow motion repeat recounts the curious journey from Jones to Riley back to Jones. Riley simply dropped the ball and usually sure-handed Lydell Mitchell could not capture it either. Bo Harris had it easily until teammate Bernard Jackson knocked it loose. Jones eventually wound up with the ball, and Cincinnati, who could have applied a crusher with possession on the Baltimore 12, saw a big opportunity and the momentum slip away. On the very next play, Jones went for Carr again. Never mind that Carr had stepped out of bounds, for even if he had stayed in, the 88-yard play was nullified by offsetting penalties. The Colts for a legal procedure, the Bengals for a personal foul. But Carr's disappointment was short-lived. The Colts simply hitched up the pads and started all over. A pass from Jones to, yes, Carr, rekindling the drive. Perhaps a bit overworked, Jones gave Carr a breather and turned to Glenn Doughty. One pass to number 35 brought a 24-yard interference call. A second, a 13-yard gain to the Bengal 22. But a third and fourth attempt failed to click.
With Dowdy used up, Jones then went back to omnipresent Roger Carr, and the rest apparently helped as he was wide open behind number 23, Bernard Jackson, who took that one false step inside. On the 22-yard score, Carr got his fifth catch and 133rd yard as the Colts climb back to trail by three. Another look reveals that Jones got good protection. Carr was well behind Jackson and Jones didn't miss. Bengals 17, Colts 14 with less than two minutes to go. But even as Carr was being congratulated, the Bengals moved to a field goal and a six-point lead at the half. But the late drive that put the Bengals in front 20 to 14 proved to be costly. A head high hit by Colt linebacker Stan White knocked Anderson out until the middle of the fourth quarter. And though the Bengals now led by six, without Ken Anderson, their lead was in jeopardy. A slow motion look shows that White actually leaped at Anderson, tackling him around the helmet. Quite a different result from Anderson's first run of the game, and in retrospect, perhaps the most important play of the game. With Kenny Anderson sidelined, the burden of moving the Bengal offense fell upon reserve quarterback John Reeves. But before Reeves could call a signal in the second half, Burt Jones and Roger Carr once again weave their magic. Carr's dazzling speed converted a simple turn-in pattern into a 65-yard touchdown sprint. And Burt Jones was the first man on the scene to congratulate him. The Jones to Carr connection had kept Baltimore in the game and now had given the Colts the lead again. And with Anderson injured, nothing coming down from upstairs figured to improve the Bengals' plight. But the very man who had tossed the Colts into the lead suddenly revealed his mortal coil. Deep in his own territory, Burt Jones gambled on a sideline pattern. But Bengal backer Ron Pritchard gambled and won. Jones' accidental kick came at a time when he would have preferred to kick himself. For three plays later, John Reeves set up behind perfect protection and rifled a strike to running back Lenville Elliott as Cincinnati converted Jones' miscue into cash. Fourteen yards and three plays, hardly a commanding drive. Still, the Bengals had made good on a golden opportunity. Though the Colts dominated the statistics, the bottom line is still the scoreboard. And once again, the arithmetic read in Cincinnati's favor. With time running out in period three, Baltimore's fierce pass rush turned in their most damaging assault of the contest. With momentum up for grabs, number 72, Fred Cook's interception brought the Bengal defense back onto the field for the sixth time in period three. And given that many opportunities, Burt Jones and the cold attack are odds-on favorites to make something happen.
Glenn Dowdy's catch and run covered 33 of the most crucial yards of the afternoon. One big offensive or defensive play often can turn a hard-fought contest around. And as period three passed into period four, running back Roosevelt Leakes culminated what Jones and Dowdy had started, crashing two yards for the all-important go-ahead touchdown. For three periods, these two AFC powerhouses had slugged it out in the center ring. But with the coming of period four came the sneaking suspicion that the seesaw had tipped for the final time. Two teams locked in a titanic struggle usually settled the matter in the pit. And as period four wore on, Lydell Mitchell and the Baltimore offensive front took charge of the scrimmage line. With time of vital importance, Baltimore pieced together an eight-minute, 15-play drive with Jones twice hitting critical third-down passes. But despite Glenn Dowdy's instructions, the officials marked this catch just inches short of a first down. Decision time. Go for the first down and hope to run out the clock or send in the field goal unit. The Colts thought they had played it safe, but their fourth down thinking backfired. This blocked kick breathed new life into the Cincinnati Bengals. Trailing by a mere point, the stage was set for a dramatic finish. An anxious Ted Marchabroda knew that one point was anything but a safe cushion against the quick strike capabilities of the Bengals, especially when Kenny Anderson reappeared on the scene and Isaac Curtis nearly broke one for the distance. An eerie hush fell over Memorial Stadium as Anderson worked the Bengals downfield. A fairy tale finish surely lurked in the minds of Bengal and Colt fans alike. And Anderson ignored potential receivers in order to get the ball to the man most likely to make that fairy tale come true. But even Isaac Curtis could not stretch that final yard needed for a Bengal first down. The cold sideline could only hope for a big defensive play. And with time on the wane, it all came down to fourth and one. To the roar of a standing ovation, a mountain of blue stopped Kenny Anderson and the Bengals cold. For number 20, Jackie Wallace and the rest of the young Baltimore Colts squad, this play advanced the Colts one more step up the ladder toward pro football's upper echelon. For not only had the Colts defeated a super football team, but they had come from behind twice to do it. Baltimore fans have suffered through a difficult rebuilding program, but last year's sudden reversal indeed has introduced a new era in Colt football, a winning era that promises only bigger and better things for Colt fans in the days ahead.